And I think that Rembrandt Peale, one of our foremost early American scientists, friend of Thomas Jefferson, actually had it more accurate with his way of thinking 200 years ago when he said, how long since these animals have existed we shall perhaps ever remain in ignorance? Certain we are that they existed in great abundance from the number of their remains which are found in America. We are likewise sure that they must have been destroyed by some sudden and powerful cause. Now, do you think that the sudden and powerful cause that decimated somewhere between 12 and 20 million woolly mammoths from, from England, across Eurasia, across Siberia, across into Alaska, in the southern United States, down through Mexico into South America, do you think that all those woolly mammoths were all hunted to extinction between 11 and 12,000 years ago by roving bands of Paleo-Indian hunters? How, how feasible is that? when you actually begin to look at it critically. I don't think it holds water. Well, in, in addition, when you begin to look at um, Rembrandt Peale, it is extremely probable that whenever and by whatever means the extirpation of this tremendous race of animals was affected, the same cause must have operated in the destruction of all those inhabitants from whom we might have received some satisfactory account of them. See what he just said? He said, well, whatever happened to wipe out the animals, if there were people around who would have preserved stories, they probably got wiped out too. Now, this is not an idea that's being seriously entertained by modern <coughs> science at all. At all. And yet, it's almost certainly true that the human species had to have been dramatically affected. You don't wipe out half the top of the food chain on Earth without affecting the human species, for crying out loud. You don't raise sea levels worldwide by 400 feet without affecting the human species, particularly when you consider that probably the, the most thriving communities on Earth that time were coastal communities. Mm. You think about that. They're all 400 feet underwater now. Or if they were all along rivers, right? There's not a river on earth that you can't document that there were tremendous ice age, terminal ice age floods. All the watersheds on earth show evidence that they were completely overwhelmed between 10 and 12,000 years ago. Can, can they predict how fast that they flooded? Fast? Well, I mean, if we had like the, the Scablands show how catastrophic the, melt, the melting was, yes. and they, interpret that in terms of sea level rise, the speed of, of sea level rise? Well, see, here's the problem. We're just in the infancy of being able to document these high resolution, with high resolution records that would actually allow us to go, all you can do now is say, well, it was here, and then a thousand years later, it was here. So what's, or, or here, and five centuries later, it's here. Now, all you do, you make a smooth profile and you assume that it's an average increase over that 500 years. The real scenario may have been completely different than that. It may have been one year, you know, or 10 years. Or if you get like the, the scablands flooding into the ocean at that greater rate in a few weeks. Well, yeah, you could raise, now see, particularly if the scablands flood was only one meltwater source issuing from the ice cap, which is what I believe. I believe you had equivalent meltwater flowing off the entire perimeter of the great ice complex. The reason it's so spectacularly preserved out in the Pacific Northwest is from the ice cap to the ocean, you had a short distance to travel over a very steep gradient. To get from the ice sheet to the Gulf of Mexico, for example, you had to travel about five times further over a much shallower gradient. So the total volume of water over time could have been equivalent, but it's not going to do nearly the work of erosion and deposition that this water coming off of, you know, traveling, descending 4,000 feet to sea level over the distance of Washington State. Like coming off of Wisconsin and Minnesota down to Mississippi, you had a descent of about 1,000 feet over 1,500 miles. Whereas in Washington State, you had a descent of 4,000 feet over about 500 miles. And that much steeper gradient causes the water to move with tre much tremendous more force and ability to 
spectacularly erode canyons and create giant gravel bars and things that you won't see in the Mississippi River Valley. But what you will see in the Mississippi River Valley is if you go into the tributary rivers coming into it, you can follow terraces up showing that water, while it wasn't moving fast like it was moving out west, it nonetheless was filling up the valley many hundreds of feet above the present floodplain. Hundreds of feet above the present floodplain. And half of the state of Louisiana was created by these great terminal ice age meltwater floods coming down the Mississippi River Valley and building this giant <coughs> delta down into the Gulf of Mexico. Most of southern Louisiana, the bayou country, is only 10,000 years old. It wasn't there during the ice age. But with the great meltdown, all of this material sediment was washed down and created this giant delta that reaches almost up to central Louisiana. So, I mean, there was a huge amount of geomorphic work done on, around the entire planet during this transition. Could you state what you told me about um, present time that people do not hunt elephants? Well, yeah, I mean, the only, the only tribe in Africa that's known to hunt elephants, ironically, is the pygmies. And when they go on an elephant hunt, that's a major deal. They only go on a few elephant hunts a year. I mean, what on earth would, would roving bands of hunters, first of all, when you've got so many animals to choose from, so many grazing animals to choose from, and smaller animals, why would they go after exclusively the biggest, hardest animal to take down out of the whole, you know, whole animal kingdom? I, can, I mean, some, I can see how somebody would have, but, you know, if, it's, if you look for modern analogs, you could see a tribe of people perhaps taking down a couple of elephants per year. But beyond that, what reason would they? They couldn't consume the flesh. The flesh would just rot. I mean, what, what on earth are gonna, they going to be taking down so many elephants that they exceed the ability of the elephants to reproduce themselves? But you see, when we get to the... When we actually get to the circumstances under which we find mammoths, we don't find anything at all consistent with human hunting. The remains of the mammoth occur on the continent, as in England, in the superficial deposits of sand, gravel, and loam, which are strewed over all parts of Europe, and they are found in still greater abundance in the same formations in Asia, especially in the higher latitudes, where the soil which forms their matrix is perennially frozen. Remains of the mammoth have been found in great abundance in the cliffs of frozen mud on the east side of the Bering Straits in Something Bay in Russian America, 66 degrees north latitude. That was back um, in 1847, Russian America was Alaska. Oh. And they have been traced as far south as the states of Ohio, Kentucky, Missouri, and South Carolina. It would thus appear that the primeval elephants formerly ranged over the whole northern hemisphere of the globe. Now notice the description of they find the remains of elephants in great abundance in cliffs of frozen mud. Okay, now what would finding elephants' remains frozen into permafrost have to do with human hunting? Would somebody explain that to me? Not much that I can see. You know, and, and how would a carcass being hunted and presumably consumed by people then be, end up frozen in permafrost? No, it was the, the act of burying them and freezing them that killed them. But the problem is, is the studies of the remains are disassociated from the actual extinction. So you can go through all of the literature, modern literature, about the extinction of the Pleistocene mammals, and what they don't talk about the circumstances under which their remains have been found. That basically has nothing to do with their demise as a species. But you'll notice, and Charles, you'll notice this, they're found in the superficial deposits of sand, gravel, and loam. <coughs> now, how did the sand and the gravel <coughs> and the loam get there? Floods. Floods, yes, floods. Almost invariably, not about 95% of the time, the remains of the extinct animals are found in flood deposits. 